Can I just, um, just for my information, just work out who you are? Who's, who's uh, a postgraduate here? Uh, it's obviously everybody else. Okay, cool. So, so, the, so most of you, um, like you, I began my student life in Yorkshire at Bradford University, and I can't, every time I come back here, which is a lot, um, I have that same feeling of the cold winds whipping across, and it, it always seems like autumn. Uh, I remember the, the winds whipping across the the bowl that Bradford sits in. We used to walk up to the Morrisons at the top of Rooley Avenue, if anybody knows that. Um, so it's, it's always good to be back. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not Mark Mardell. Uh, he'll be here later. But Mark and I um, go back a long way. And I'll just tell you this little story just to illustrate how um, things have changed in, uh, in broadcasting uh, since those far off days when Mark and I uh, were in the early stages of our radio careers. He was at Radio Air in Leeds, and I was at Pennine Radio in Bradford, along with uh, Richard Horsman, who you all know. Um, and we were the breakfast news presenters, which is a great job to do in radio. It's with when people listen to radio most, so it was a great job to do. But there was only one of us. Um, Richard reminds me that occasionally he used to come in and, he, and clean cartridges for me, which was the, the way we played inserts in those days. Uh, but for the most part, there wasn't really anybody else there. So if you needed another voice to voice up a report on something that had come in overnight, there were no computers in those, well, there were computers, but not in the newsroom. It was old-fashioned typewriters. You had to press the keys pretty hard to make anything type, and everything had to be in duplicate. It's all on carbon paper. So if Mark and I needed a report voicing, we would swap. So I would read down the phone to him a report that I'd written, would voice it up and send it back to me as a report. So I could come on air and say, X has happened. Mike Best has been arrested on suspicion. Goodness knows what Mark Mardell reports. And Mark's voice comes out. And then we do the same thing the other way, the other way around. So Mark and I um, go back a very long way. I was, I was joking about Mark being arrested on, on, this, on this particular occasion. Um, now, um, I have, does anyone know what I've done with my phone? Um, oh, someone's, someone's probably put it out of the way in case it, in case it rings. Actually, actually, that's my notes for the, um, for the lecture, so I kind of um, need that. Um, the other thing to say is that I'm still, uh, I'm still a bit of a local. Uh, my ex-mother-in-law lives at the top of Tinsdale Lane up the hill, just there about a mile away. I've been staying last night with uh, her son. West Scotland. I'm going to I'm going to check in there, right? West Scotland Lane. All right. Okay. Let's do it the other way around. Who does know where Scotland Lane is? That is absolutely pathetic. <laughs> Seriously, it's pathetic. no. Right. Tell them. Yeah. It's about 100 yards from here. <laughs> Seriously, if you're journalists, if I discover that, if I, if I was going to potentially employ you, discover that you hadn't noticed the name of the road that you've passed presumably every day, I'd be pretty impressed. Seriously. I had a suspicion that might be the case. Uh, and in the old days, you'd have probably been sent out the door here and now. But open your eyes. Be curious. Observe. You won't get very so if you're not more that. I thought I might find six you didn't to find only six you do know. Um, not very good. Um, let me take you back to 1993. I know it's for you, but Mike Best was uh, only in the middle of his career. We have motorways and the Germans have autobahns, so the Australians, like the Americans, have freeways. Soon after Castle Hill, I turned right onto the F4 and headed for the Blue Mountains, 80-odd miles out of Sydney, and they look blue because of the haze from the eucalyptus trees. The Beatles from 1983. Um, I was sent to Australia um, slightly against my will. 
Um, uh, we, the Pennine Radio was given to Australia, and uh, the people around the station those days said, we think you should go. So I was persuaded to go. And one of the things we did, uh, in addition to me driving around the, uh, the countryside, was to arrange uh, phone link-ups with uh, people in the Huddersfield West Leeds areas who had... Now, these days, you can Skype and do what you like. In those days, it was quite a big deal um, to have a phone call, especially if you're doing it on Pennine Radio. So we got letters from uh, listeners wanting to be part of that. Uh, we got letters, one in Sydney, one in Melbourne. Um, and the idea was that I would go and visit the Australian family, unannounced, just knock on the door. Communications are different there, you could get away with that. So I just knocked on the door and said, hi, I'm from England. Actually, I'm from Bradford, I'm from Pennine Radio. Um, I'd invite, get myself invited in, because it was all carefully timed. Pennine Radio would ring, and we would have their family, the whole family in the studio, on the line, work eventually. But the, the, uh, the other part of this was that I would do regular um, uh, phone calls in, live, live, live phone calls to keep the listeners up to date with what was going on. And on that day, the day that I'd been to the Blue Mountains, my car broke down. Uh, the thing that you all know about is you don't miss a deadline. So I had to find some way, and this is in the day you know, before mobile phones. It's a different area, hard for you to, to imagine. So I drove down the nearest road with the clock ticking, knocked on any old door. Uh, a girl aged about 16, 17 answered the door. I explained who I was, could come in and ring England from their phone. She said, yeah, fine. <laughs> so I came in, and I'm on air to Pennine, and I become aware of her father having appeared in the back garden. And he was less keen on the whole idea than I was. And I, while I was broadcasting, I heard him say to her, I'm not bloody palm using my bloody phone. <laughs> um, but I, um, she calmed him down. I got away with it. Um, the point of the story, uh, technology has changed however many years that is. And we know it can change uh, a whole lot more uh, in your career. Those of you who make a career in, in journalism, I'm going to tell you one other thing about those days. Five. Uh, Leeds against Norwich, I'm still working for Pennine Radio. It is a very, very weather-wise. You may be familiar with that, having spent six months at least in this part of the world. So my game, I'm due to cover Bradford City. The game is called off. Uh, one of my colleagues is due to cover Leeds against Norwich. And I say to the sports editor, look, I'll just go along and sit alongside him. At least Norwich I won't interfere. But I made it in my afternoon. So I turn up. I descended at Ellen Road. And in those days, the, the press box at Ellen Road, it's not true now, was level with one penalty area. Don't know why just was. Um, and it was a real struggle to see the ball when it was in the other half of the pitch for his commentary. And I had one of the old-fashioned mobile phones with me. Um, this is breaking up badly, isn't it? This, this, shall I just do it without a mic? Is that going to be better? I'll just take it off. Who needs a mic? Okay. Um, oh, that's, that's, okay. You need a mic, don't you, because the live streaming. You're going to have to have it, aren't you? Okay, okay. Sorry about the crackling. Um, so I took this old-fashioned mobile phone, which was a little bit bigger than that, okay, seriously, uh, and certainly a lot heavier than that, but it worked, kind of. So I took that phone, which I had with me, took it to level with the other penalty area, just sat in amongst the fans, and when the ball went from one half of the pitch to the other half of the pitch, the commentator was assigned to the game, handed over to me. I would pick up the commentary because I could actually see the ball. And when it went back to his half, I say, over to you, Steve, and he'd pick it up. And so we went on. Uh, technology, as I say, has changed um, quite a bit over the years, but you can always make it. That's an early example. It's the equivalent um, of the kind of thing that I think you had to talk about um, yesterday from Nick Garnett about uh, how you use modern technology. You always have to look to make the very most um, of what you've got. Okay. That just by, um, by way of a start. 
so I, when uh, my equivalent of your course was Cardiff, you'll all be, most of you will be aware, I'm sure, of the, the Cardiff um, School of Journalism. In those days, 1981 82, it was one postgraduate course, 25 students, that was it. We operated in a detached house, number 34, Cathedral Road, Cardiff. Uh, that was it. There are now hundreds of students there. Uh, you name a kind of journalism course, they've got it. Um, Mike and his colleagues will know, know more about it than I do, but in, that was one of the, the forerunners of, uh, of journalism courses. Uh, it, was, um, it was founded by a guy called Sir Tom Hopkinson, who was the editor of the Picture Post. Uh, one or two of you may have heard of that long dead, um, very famous um, journalistic publication, Photo Journalism, and we had a weekly lecture each week from him on photo journalism. The Korean War, 1953, was covered mostly, mo mo most um, significantly in this country by the, by the picture post, the photos that brave photojournalists brought back from the, the front line. Kath, you've got an email. Um, <laughs> or maybe that's me. Maybe I've got an email. We'll leave it till later. Um, so he was, a, he was an outstanding talent. There was another guy called, maybe I shouldn't say the other guy's name, but he was the, the professor. Uh, I think he was nominally head of the course. Um, and his very best days were past him. Uh, and we were in a room a bit like this, and I, I don't know why he was talking about um, great political leaders, but he was. And he said, now then, uh, if you take the example of, um, oh dear, the example of um, oh, uh, Russian chappy, Lenin, Lenin. Um, so his, his, uh, his very des best days were past him, but it was an excellent course. Um, they, the people running it were mostly print ex-print journalists, you're lucky here to have really excellent um, broadcast professionals um, on your course. Most of our people were, were print specialists, but it gave us all a really good, even those of us who ended up in broadcasting, a really good grounding in what I would call proper journalism. And the fact that I do sports journalism and my colleagues do sports journalism is neither here nor there. It's, it's all journalism. You've got to get your, your facts right, you've got, to, you've got to write properly, you've got to check, 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 check. I'm going to make you sit up now, having made that point. Uh, because I, I took the trouble to read, um, I think pretty much all of the preview pieces that the postgrads were kind enough uh, to write about those of us who were uh, appearing this week as guest speakers. Disappointing to find the level of checking wasn't what it might be and certainly wasn't what it would have to be if you're going to get jobs in this industry. What did we have? We had um, somebody referring to the death of Princess Diana in 1997. Small p for princess. Anyone think that's a good idea? No. Just check it. Um, somebody else wrote Princess Anne, spelt A double N. There is an E on the end of this word. These things matter. Um, one of the high-profile investigations the reporter conducted was a TV report from inside the ranks of the English Defence League. Defence spelt with an S, where there should be a C at the end. These things matter. And if you write that kind of stuff in a CV or in your accompanying letter, I can promise you, because I'm in that position of hiring or not hiring people, that immediately turns me against somebody. They haven't bothered to check they don't know enough, they haven't got the basics right. So how can I be sure that if they're going to be writing me a story and say that Rory McIlroy won the Open by five shots, that it might have not actually been four shots and they didn't check? Okay, that's why these things matter. The, fi the BBC Five Live reporter who broadcast more than 50 live reports, here we go to Nick, Nick Garnett again, um, et cetera, et cetera. BBC Five Live, it is difficult to write BBC Five Live because they do slightly change how they write BBC Five Live, but there is a clear way they do it, and it's not the way that it was written on your website. Um, as ITV celebrates, as ITV celebrates their Royal Television Society Award wins, is it singular or plural? You can't have ITV celebrates their Royal Television Society Award wins. Either ITV is either singular or plural. Decide which. Okay, all that stuff. If you write stuff like that, I'm going to stop the persecution now. Uh, if you write stuff like that, then people like me will notice. And we, if we've got 
50 excellent applications, time is precious. You might say no. No bother with that one. So we on to the next one. Okay. Um, how did I get to Cardiff in the first place? Just briefly. Um, I wanted to be a journalist once I stopped wanting to drive trains about the age of eight. Um, so all through my school days, I read the Radio Times avidly every week I knew who was presenting what. And I listened, and this is a really good lesson that you can still follow. I listened, even at that age, even in my school days, and certainly you should be doing it now, those of you interested in, in broadcasting in any way, Mike's not leaving because he's bored, he's not, not leaving only because he's bored with my, what I'm saying, it's because he's going to go and meet Mark Mardell, who you'll see later on. Um, listen and watch and read stuff with different eyes. Don't just consume it as a consumer, but consume it as a student. Why have they written that intro like that? If you're reading, if, you're, if your pet love is fashion and you're just reading it, why do they write the intro like that? Is it a good intro? Is the photo right? How would you have improved it? Do that all the time. If you don't do that, you probably won't improve as much as you could do. I, I say this now to, to people who, are, who have jobs in my, in my department. The ones who listen um, are the ones who, who learn the lessons and, and who do improve. I remember just going back very briefly to my to my Cardiff days, um, if you think your lecturers are sometimes harsh on you, think I'm being harsh on you, um, we're probably all pussycats compared with uh, Alan Coles, former Mirror sub-editor who reduced all of the girls on our course to tears and some of the boys as well, I think. Uh, I went to Cardiff City to watch the football every week and we had to file a report every time. And one week, I remember now, he wrote in red, balls, balls, balls on my copy. Um, which was a kind of double-edged sword. Uh, a, he thought it was just balls, and B, I'd written the word ball um, too often. But it was, it was a, Cardiff was a tough, a tough upbringing, but you remembered and you learned, and I'd, I'd, I'd benefit hugely from that, as I'm sure you will benefit from um, all the expertise in front of you here. Um, I'd kind of given up the idea of being a journalist because... No one at school particularly encouraged it. My mum and dad said, you're not pushy enough. It's too difficult to get in. It's much tougher now, by the way. Um, and I kind of got into it almost by the, by the back door and with a bit, of, a bit of luck. I had a very good careers teacher who said, when you're choosing A-levels and degree beyond that, just choose something you enjoy, something you like, something you're good at. Don't worry too much about where it might lead. I was good at languages, so I did German and Russian, which is... Uh, Occasionally proved directly useful. It's proved indirectly useful in, in all sorts of, of ways, as you can imagine, because journalism is, is about using language to a, a large extent, and, and studying languages is, is no bad thing. But that, that wasn't really the, the point. I, was, I ended up applying for two kinds of jobs, therefore, at the end of the university. One was export sales. I thought I can, I can use my German in export sales. I can even learn French or Spanish if I have to. I would have been rubbish at it, I think, but I got quite close to jobs, and I would probably have taken them. But luckily, Bradford University started its, uh, its radio station in my final year. And I wouldn't be here now, I don't think, if it hadn't done. It was called Radio Ram Air. I think it's still going. Um, it is. Richard Horsman, who knows everything, confirms it is still going. Uh, I tried to find an old clip of me being absolutely rubbish as a DJ on Radio Ram Air, but I, I failed, to, failed to find one. Um, but that was fantastic. And we, the lesson from that that I pass on to you is that we always aimed high. We, when the Prime Minister of, in that day, Edward Heath, came, I think he was by then already a former Prime Minister, I think, but he's a very big figure. Uh, he came to West Yorkshire. Uh, we got an interview with him, and BBC Radio Leeds, Leeds didn't. Uh, we asked first, and we were very persistent. Um, aim, always aim high. You never know. If you don't ask, you don't get. Um, so we, we did a show that was totally different to everything else that was, uh, was on the radio station. It was mostly just people playing, playing records and having fun. Uh, probably weren't even sober half the time. Two mates and I um, did a show called Thank God It's Friday, and it was a kind of news magazine show, and we got loads of interviews, and that's what uh, gave me the ammunition to apply for and get um, the place at Cardiff University. And the other um, masterstroke, or the only masterstroke on my part, um, was when it came to the Easter placement. It was a one-year postgrad course at Cardiff. And in those days, you could pretty much go where you wanted. I know competition for placements now is really tough. 
you could go where you wanted. So I thought, well, I'm going to be far more use in a city that I know if I can hit the ground running than anywhere else. So I applied to Horsman's Mob in, um, in Bradford to Pennine Radio, and, uh, and I, I got, a job, got a job there six weeks later. I did my three weeks. They sacked somebody very happily six weeks after that and rang me up and said, you want a job? Um, so I said yes. So it became one of a newsroom of uh, six very different days. People, nearly everybody smoked in the in the newsroom. Um, true, Richard. Yeah, it's yeah. smelt of uh, yeah, smelt of smoke. Old-fashioned typewriters, as I've uh, described already. But I had I had four really good years there. Didn't even particularly want to leave, but it, eventually um, you have to you have to move on a bit. Uh, so I applied to television. Never wanted to be in TV. Always wanted to be in radio. As a kid, wanted to be in radio, not TV. Um, but I applied on spec to, or I won't lie, I'll tell you the story why, why I left. Um, doesn't reflect very well on me, uh, but I'm, it's 25 years ago. Didn't want to be the boss of anything. I was kind of the unofficial deputy news editor, and I knew that the news editor was going to leave the end of the summer. This was about May time we're talking about. He was leaving in three months' time to go in the Middle East. I was pretty certain I'd be offered his job, Definitely didn't want it. Head of blame. No, thank you. Uh, it'd be different now, I think, but in those days, didn't want to do it. So I knew it would be very, look very bad to turn down the job. I thought it'd be even worse for me if I accepted it. So I thought I'm going to leave. Um, so for that reason alone, I left radio. Uh, I applied on spec. I wrote a letter to Yorkshire Television. I said, "Have you got any jobs?" They said, "No," uh, but I got them to let me in, come and have a chat, and um, they found me a job. Um, and I was at Yorkshire Television for 10 years, and those of you who are here early have seen this already, um, but the rest of you who haven't, oh, actually, I think you've all seen this because it's, it's used in your, on your course, but just a little reminder of how I've changed so much for the better. This was me in, goodness knows what year, nine, somewhere between 1986 and 1996. I hadn't even remembered I'd done this program. Welcome. In doctor's surgeries, it's the sniff and sneeze season. Sore throats, coughs, cold and flu symptoms. One or other will surely get some of us before the winter's through. So, how can we try to avoid these irritations and illnesses? Well, Stephen Wright is a GP, well used to the sound of sniffles, I would think, Stephen. Let's start with the basics. What is a cold and what's flu and what's the difference? Well, they are different. Uh, flu, which is a general idea. I'll come back to the beard in a, in a moment. Um, I must ask Catherine afterwards what you use that clip for, Catherine. My, the, mind, the mind boggles. I hope it's not to say, here's how you don't present television programs. But um, the, only thing I'd, I'd, the only thing I look at that, uh, look at my younger self from 25 years ago and think, actually, that's quite good. It is, there is an autocue there. I'm reading a script, but it doesn't much look as I'm reading a script. It is, it is, it is natural presentation. And... Um, that's what we try really hard to get our, our younger presenters to work towards, is to try and be natural and to move off script, because it's much easier to, to watch uh, if you feel that the presenter is talking to you rather than just talking. Um, but that is, um, that is what I looked like then. I had 10 great years at uh, a Yorkshire Television. I hadn't remembered that series at all. It brings the faintest of bells. I'd know it. If you'd said to me last month, did you ever present a program called Help Yourself? I would have said no, I didn't. I was, think I was aware that there was one. I didn't know I did it. The variety was one of the great things. Um, I never closed my eyes or my ears to any opportunity, any door. Um, so that actually, this is quite a good example of it. I had no idea I'd done that. I did, I did quiz shows. I think um, the clip that from, um, from Mike Best that's running on your website about me mentioned that so I did a quiz show. I've got a, I've got a vague memory of that. I did lots of sports programs. Uh, my, my staple was being a news reporter on calendar and a presenter on calendar, um, working with um, the late, great Richard Whiteley and Krista Aykroyd, uh, who I partly taught to present um, TV. Um, she was also at Pennine Radio, by the way, and was one of those contributing to the smoke in the newsroom. <laughs> Remember it well. Um, tell you a lot of good stories about Krista. Um, but then she tells you, 
she'll tell you even better ones about herself. She's one, one of Krista's great attributes is being able to tell a really funny story against herself. Um, but she also, by the way, is a really excellent journalist. And the reason that she's been so successful is because she's a proper journalist with proper training who's never forgotten those roots and would check and would never have written. Oh, I missed one out. I missed one out. But forgive me, I don't know how you pronounce his, his name, but Paraik, or the, 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 one, of your, one of your guests, st this week, started his career as a BCC trainee in 2001. I thought, well, maybe there is a BCC. Maybe it's the Br Broadcasting Complaints Council. So I looked it up, and of course it was BBC. Um, check. Check. I'll shut up about checking in a, in a minute. Um, but going back to the variety that I was given um, at Yorkshire TV, I remember one particular Thursday and Friday, we had a program called... Um, do you know, I've forgotten what the political program was called now. Anyway, there was a political program. If Mike Best was here, he'd tell me, because he was in charge of it. Um, political program that went out on a Thursday night, live. Um, and I very occasionally contributed to that. If there was a lot of stuff I needed doing, Nick is a safe pair of hands. Nick, go out and do some politics for us. So on the first night, I did um, calendar politics, whatever it was called. And on the following night, on the Friday, I was live in Sunderland for YTV Fight Night. Um, and not many people get to be in the privileged position where you do politics one night and boxing the next. But that's the reason why I stayed so long, and that's the reason why I've stayed so long at Sky, uh, is that I've been given lots of things to do, but I've been given lots of things to do because I didn't, I didn't close any doors. I didn't say, no, no, I can't do that. Other people do that. I do sport or I do politics. Um, I do whatever anyone is going to ask me to do. But in each thing you do, you have to gen yourself up. I've covered every general election bar one since 1979, um, and I, I don't know yet whether I'm required this year. Um, but, you know, I, although I'm now a full-time sports journalist, I make jolly sure that I'm a political expert by the time we go on air on election night. Otherwise, um, who would want to use you? So, um, it came to 1995, and I thought, I've been here 10 years, love what I do. Um, didn't mind the, um, in quotes, fame, as long as people don't disturb me in restaurants. I quite, quite like the idea, always quite like the idea that people come up and say, hello, like watching you, because the time to worry is always if people don't come up, because you think, well, who the hell's watching you if no one's recognising you and no one's coming to say hello. Um, I'll tell you a little story. Um, I'm going to have to invent, I'll invent the other name here, okay, the other... I'm going to change the other person in this story to Richard Horsman. It's actually a guy called Chris Kiddy, who was um, uh, a calendar reporter many years. But it's going to, for today, it's going to be Richard Horsman. So I'm in Morrison's. Actually, Morrison's in Horsforth, as it happens. Um, a lot of you will have been in there to get your groceries. So I'm in there. And this is quite unlike in the South, where people... I've found garage attendants who've served me for years, years, and finally one day will say, oh, I saw you on TV last night. They've wanted to say that for years, never quite plucked up the courage because people are more standoffish in the, in the South. They're not standoffish up here at all. So this chap sees me in Morrison's, and um, I'm going to use you, excuse me, sees me in Morrison's and grabs hold of me and holds me like that by the aisle, says, and his wife is saying, Vera, Vera, Richard Orsman. Um, so he'd recognised me, but he hadn't quite remembered my name. But the fact that he grabbed hold of me uh, is the difference between the North and the South, as I was to discover when I, when I went to Sky. But um, I thought, I'm getting to be slightly vulnerable here. I've been on the same TV channel every, almost every night for um, nearly 10 years. Um, it's going fine, but if a different boss comes in, doesn't like me, I'm then looking for a different job and not on my own terms, and the next employer is going to say, well, why have you been in the same job 10 years, and why do you need a new one? So I started doing some producing. Again, it goes back to having, keeping the, the basic journalistic skills, not just, not just going down there, some people go down, I'm a presenter now, okay, that's all I have to do. Keep all the skills going that you've got, because you never know when they're going to come in useful. So I produced Calendar um, quite a lot. Uh, I produced various other half-hour programs, but there wasn't a job going. There wasn't a job for me. I wanted to do it seriously. So I applied to Sky News. There was a 
A job advert shows how things have changed, you know, how, how, how big Sky is now and how bright and bold everything is from Sky. This advert uh, for a news producer had all the size and color and pizzazz of an ad for your second-hand bike in the Ilkley Gazette. But I spotted it somehow. I applied. I heard nothing for three weeks. And then I got a phone call at home at half past nine on a Sunday night from, as it happens, the man who is now the head of Sky News. He was then in charge of the Sunrise program, breakfast time program on Sky News. And he said, I've seen your, your application, very interested. We'd like to come and do a shadow shift. So I arranged that I would do a shadow shift some weeks down the line, Sunday night. Tuesday, I got a letter from Sky HR, Sky Personnel. Dear Mr. Powell, Thank you for your application. Sorry you've been unsuccessful on this occasion. Good luck in the rest of your career. That's Tuesday. Thursday, got another call from a different producer, a different strand at Sky News. Loved your application. Any chance you could come and do a shadow shift? So it's complete and sh utter shambles. It's changed a lot uh, now. I ended up going to the, the, uh, the Sunrise program. I did one overnight shift, 11 p.m. to 11 a.m. TV is always glamorous. Uh, at the end of that, I had what I suppose you would call an interview. And the, one of the two guys conducting this uh, interview in a little box room uh, was an uh, Australian deputy head of news, Mike Nolan. And he looked at me and said, my only worry about you, mate, is that in six months' time you'll miss live broadcasting. <laughs> you'll be knocking on my door wanting to go back on air. I said, I don't know. You know I'm, I'm really serious about producing. That's what I want to do. Um, I don't know if I'm, how much you're going to miss it. If I do knock on your door in six months, what are you going to say? And he said, shave the beard off, mate. Um, so I did, and, uh, and here I am. I, I did 10 months um, as a news producer on uh, the Sunrise program and then became a producer-presenter uh, on the Sky News Sports Desk in December '96. Um, and I've been doing essentially that ever since. I, I don't produce anymore. I couldn't produce anymore because the, uh, here we go with technology again, uh, it, it, it would be virtually impossible for a full-time presenter, I think, to, to do that job and keep up with all the skills that a, a producer now needs because all the, all, as you could probably have an insight into, all the stuff, almost all the stuff that we put on air is edited by the journalists and not by, um, not by a craft editor, although we do still have craft editors and, we, and we, do, we do make use of them. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, but first of all, I need to play you a little clip. This is from about uh, three weeks ago, something like that, from Sky Sports News. This, this again goes back to what I was talking about, about variety. Um, and the reason I've stayed at Sky so long is that I've been given all sorts of different things to do when Channel 5 News was pr produced by Sky News for quite a long time. In the first year, they got me to do a sports program. I also do quite a lot of Sky Sports News presenting. Um, only those of you who are sports nuts will have ever seen me um, do this, but uh, I'll play you this clip, and then I'll explain why I'm playing it. And Darren Hart likes to chat as well. He's described being appointed Europe's new Ryder Cup captain as the greatest honour of his career. A five-man panel unanimously selected Clark to captain Europe at Hazeltine, ahead of Spain's Miguel Angel Jimenez and Denmark's Thomas Bjorn. The 2011 Open oh. champion is the first Northern Irishman to captain a European team in the Ryder Cup. He's got the pedigree. He's played in five and was a vice captain in 2010 and 2012. He succeeds Paul McGinley, who led Europe to a five-point victory over the USA at Glen Eagles in 2014. Huge privilege to follow in the steps of so, so many great uh, European captains. How many people... How many people do you reckon were involved in getting that to air? How many do you think? Give me a guess. Give me a number. Five. Five. Anybody else? Any more guesses? How many, how many do you think? Three. Three? What about you, sir? Row four. Try and look away from me. Seven. Seven. What about you, sir, in the purple? <coughs> Fifteen. Big increase. Very back with the, with the hood on. 
or well, the hood not on, but it nearly <coughs> must be cold up there. Nine, so we've had five, seven, nine, fifteen. Uh, what about you falling nearly asleep? It's propping your head up. Five. Uh, let's ask the grown ups. Richard Horsman, how many do you think? One. <laughs> I think he's being deliberately obtuse. <laughs> Kath? Three. Okay. Um, can I have a volunteer? I'll pick someone if there's some. Who, who's, who's, I'm going to give somebody a microphone and ask, ask them to help me here. Uh, where, did that, where did the mic go? The, um, Mohammed, where's the mic? Oh, that's because it's time for Okay, you're just, you're just going to shout then. Okay, fine. Uh, who's going to be a volunteer? It's not difficult. It's not difficult. I'm going to pick somebody then. I'm going to pick, because you're right in the middle, my friend in the light jumper there. Right. Okay. What's your name, sir? Sam. Sam? Yeah. Right. Sam is going to tell you just how wrong you all were. The person who said 15 wasn't quite so wrong as the rest of you. You got a big, loud voice, Sam? Um, Good. I can't find it. No, no, it's not, the, it's not just the figure. You're going, to take us, you're going to take us through this. Okay, Sam is going to tell you. If we get bored with Sam, we can move the paper on a bit. Sam's going to tell us about the process of getting that story uh, on air. Sam, you don't have to read exactly what's written here. You can, I didn't write this. This was just given to me by a colleague who bashed it out in a hurry. So your job is to make this intelligible and interesting to all your, all your colleagues, which is essentially what the job is when you're... If I'm presenting a sports item, there's a, the piece of news doesn't change, but to make people watch, especially on Sky News Sport. Sports Bulletin on Sky News is five, five minutes long, if I'm lucky. It might be two, Okay. And we're broadcasting to people who are not sports nuts. How many, are, how many are sports fans of one kind or another in here? If any? Oh, quite a lot. Okay, all right. The, the problem is, is not you. The problem is the people who are not sports fans, okay? We do not want them to switch off, change channels, go and make a cup of tea. We want them to carry on watching the sports bulletin. So we want to make it interesting, which is why I might leave out an item altogether that might be top of the hour on Sky Sports News. Phil Jagielka signs a new four-year contract at Everton. Breaking news, probably, on Sky Sports News. Massive red across the screen. Probably wouldn't run it at all on Sky News. Man not expected to leave doesn't leave. That is not news. Um, it's, okay, it's a story. What we want is if there's a, um, a mongoose pops up and... and interfere slightly at the golf, yeah, we'll put that on, because that is going to stop people who's, who's not a sports fan or only a little bit of a sports fan, it might stop them going off to make a cup of tea. So that's why we're trying to make it interesting, like, so Sam is going to make this interesting for you, uh, and he's going to con convey, sub it down a bit, okay, don't tell, us, don't tell us every word on there, but Sam's going to tell you the process of getting that item on screen, without it all taking too long, Sam, big challenge, I know, sorry. Okay, uh, the answer is 20 people. Yep. 20. Uh, the first person is a cool persona, um, telling a detailed story um, from the village press conference um, in Durham, and he creates the slur. Okay, and this, this, the, 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 the version that Sam's got, it's not Darren Clark, it's a Premier League press conference, okay, so don't, but don't worry about that. The, the principles are the same. Carry on, Sam, nice loud voice. Uh, number two is the news editor, uh, it decides if we're covering the story. Uh, yep. Bread and butter staple of our content. Yep. Uh, and then he assigns number three, which is a reporter. Yep. Number four, which is a crew coordinator. And number five, which is a cameraman. Uh, and our satellite coordinator, which is number six. But satellite engineer, which is number seven. Yeah. Seven people so far. We, left the yet. we haven't left the office yet. So that's seven. So those of you who said three, four, five, we haven't even got to do, go and shoot the interview yet, never mind get it on the air. Uh, so you were so far short of the number of people required. Sam, carry on. Uh, on the day the shoot happened, the question is asked, material recorded, and card handed to engineer on location. Don't worry about the next bit. Carry on. Chain resumes. Chain resumes of a call from a software engineer to a technician in the MCR village number eight, who checks each receiving signal from engineer's satellite. MCR, master, master control room, it's the bit where the hub where everything incoming comes into at Sky or any, anywhere else at uh, any other television station. Yep, Sam, carry on. Uh, MCR crew Sky Sports News ingest the hub for all incoming feeds of BT operators there. 
Yeah. We make sure we're recording material on our server and assign the name to that material. Excellent. Okay, Sam, thank you very much. That's 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 kind of the first half. Thank you very much to Sam. Sam, you choose somebody to do to do part two. There we go. Right. What's your name, sir? Kiel. Kiel. Okay. So we're we're up to uh, the material in the building, halfway down your page. Now production takeover. Yeah, nice and loud. System works best when the reporter contacts TSD ahead of the speed with the strongest uh, new mention in the which should be on air as soon as possible. The TSD looks out for the party in interviews and the clips up for the sound bite, uh, marking it out. And TSD then liaises. Liaises, yeah. Yeah, uh, sub editor number 11. So you're getting. You're getting um, different journalists here in television who are working in essentially in input and output. The, the news gathering process, there's a news editor, a planning department who decide what we're going to cover, send out reporters, they're all part of the, the, the news gathering process, the, the input side, the output side, uh, in, in our case, and in, both in Sky Sports News and in Sky News, um, you're talking about teams of, let's say, half a dozen, actually slightly, quite a bit more than that in Sky Sports News, who are in charge of a segment of output, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours. Um, and it is their job to shape all the material that Sam told us about that's, that's come into the building, now to shape that into, into decent television. Carry on. <coughs> Desktop edits, that's what I was talking about before, that the, 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 the journalist, the sub-editor, will, will very often, mostly, will just, just edit those pictures themselves to, to, to get it on the air quickly. If it's a complicated job, we call in a craft editor. We get it done um, by the, the, the experts, but for the most part, uh, we don't need that. You get a picture editor to take the that's him. Picture. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we're two-thirds of the way through the process. Choose somebody to, to take us through the, the next bit. Okay. What's your name, sir? Danny. Danny. Okay. Danny, fire away. We're down to materials ready for transmission, but we're not done yet. <coughs> yeah. So gallery producer, really important job, really, really stressful. You think being on air is stressful, and it is. It's far more stressful. Uh, being the gallery producer, the person who sits in the studio and says, right, we're going to drop that item that we've worked for three days on because somebody else has come in and we really, although it's really tempting to go with what we spent three days working on, we're just going to have to drop it for now because we've got to break the news that Phil Jagielka signed a new four-year contract if we think that is, that, that is worth transmitting. Carry on. And um, thank you very much to everyone who's, who's helped there. And we haven't even mentioned people like uh, makeup to make sure that um, people don't faint when I come on the telly, um, auto queue operator, um, people who've been in the business as long as I have can manage quite happily without auto queue operators, but um, for, for a lot of stories as I am doing today, but um, you kind of need them. Um, floor managers. Lighting, all sorts of people like that who make sure that, that it all looks okay. A lot of people, a lot of jobs in, lot of jobs in telly. Anybody want to work in telly? Anybody want a job in telly? Nobody wants a job in telly. Oh, yes, one or two. <laughs> Leah, what do, you want to, what do you want to do in telly? Why? Leah said she wants to work in Sky Sports, by the way. She's whispering. You wouldn't have heard that at the back, but she does want to work in Sky Sports. What do you want to do for Sky Sports? Um, she likes, I'd like to. She likes, 
You'd like to be a reporter, okay? You'll need to talk louder than that. <laughs> we have microphones, but you'll still need to talk louder than that. You'll need to be, need to be more animated. Why do you want to do that? Okay. Uh, you had your hand up as well. You want to work in telly? Um, yeah. What do you want to do? What do you want to do in telly? Um, presenter. Why? Because I quite enjoyed it when we when we did it here, and I was better than I thought I would be. Okay, that, that, that's an okay answer. The, the the world is full of people who want to work in telly, and the almost the first question I almost always ask is why. Um, you get if anybody thinks it's going to be glamorous. Um, the number of times uh, camera crews and I have muttered about this must be the glamour of telly as we've been rained on, kicked, uh, whatever. Um, I, could, um, I could have retired years ago if I'd had a five pound every time that had happened. Um, Yes, the story's just floating into my mind, uh, and it's, it's quite local. Uh, who's been out to Howarth? Anybody been out to Howarth? Yeah, oh, lots of you. Excellent. Good. Um, you know, bleak it is out there. There was a story that um, one of Kath's colleagues sent me out on one day. There was some new development at the Bronte Museum in Howarth. I can't recall what it was. It was connected with international tourism. Might have been setting up some kind of new international link. So we went off. We... In conducted interviews at the museum, we did the usual shots, but we thought we we're going to have to go out on the moors and get some shots of Top Withens, the famous uh, location from um, Wuthering Heights. So we went out there, and as we went out there, the cameraman, sound man, and I, uh, the heavens opened, we got completely and utterly soaked. We must have muttered about the glamour of telly quite a lot on that walk. It's quite a long walk especially for the camera with heavy equipment. But as luck would have it, um, as we got to Top Withens, miles from anybody, no one else for miles around, no one else was stupid enough to go out on a day like that except cameraman who had to get the story back, except that we went round the corner of Top Withens and there sheltering were two Japanese tourists. And how good was that? Um, the, the, the piece was absolutely made sometimes, but sometimes, you, as, in, as in life, so in journalism, you make your own luck. Uh, had we not bothered to... We, there are shots in the library. Um, as, um, as you mentioned, reading out that, the last bit, library can help. Archive footage, we could have got shots of, of Top Withens from a previous day, but it wouldn't, wouldn't have been right, wouldn't have felt right. We want today's shots. And by going out and getting today's shots, we got the interview that, that made the piece. As the old guy said, the harder I work, the luckier I seem to get. Who was the old guy? Anyone know who said that? Go on. Gary, Player. Gary Player, yeah. One of the most successful golfers of all time. The harder I work, the luckier I seem to get. Applies in most areas of life. It certainly applies in, in journalism. So, uh, here I am. Um, I am the sports editor of Sky News, but I'm not employed by Sky News anymore. I'm now employed by Sky Sports. I won't bore you with the internal <coughs> ramifications of that. I've had three years being the man who actually hires and fires on the Sky News Sports Desk. After the reorganization we've had, um, I'm, I'm no longer um, in charge to that extent, which is great because I get more time to do actual presenting. I'm still in charge of, uh, of presenters. Um, I don't envisage leaving Sky anytime soon. It's a great place to work. It's a very dynamic place to work. You can get stuff done um, more quickly than you can at, say, the BBC, as I'm sure Mark Mardell will tell you when he comes around the corner any moment now. Um, I'm, 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 a, I'm a pretty happy bunny, um, but it comes through hard work. And I, st I still have to say to my younger colleagues, not quite every day, but very, very often, the kind of thing I've been saying to you this morning, you have to keep working at it, you have to get stuff right, you have to make your own luck. So even though I've been doing this business, what, nearly 33 years now, I still work as hard as I ever did uh, keeping up to date. Um, I'm quite anal about it, but you have to be. I record in some form or other, and the, the way I've recorded stuff has changed over the years with technology. I now use the iTunes app mostly and the BBC iPlayer, but I hear some way or other every day the um, BBC Five Live 7.30 or 8.30 a.m. sports desk and the half 11 at night sports desk 
and the first half hour at least of the main Five Live Sport program at seven o'clock, in addition to all the Sky stuff that I, um, that I consume one way or another. Um, I read the Telegraph as it happens. Everyone has a favorite. I read the Telegraph sports supplement pretty much cover to cover every day. When I go on holiday abroad, my news agent keeps those for me and I read them when I come back because you cannot afford to be on air on Sky News and somebody says to me, Jeremy Thompson, Kay Burley says to me, so how does this compare with what happened last week? Nick, I can't say, sorry, Jeremy, it's on holiday last week, not sure. You have to know, you have to keep working. You can't stand still. You have to keep working as hard as on day one. And maybe as a result of that, I have the same enthusiasm, it doesn't apply to all my colleagues, but I do have the same enthusiasm as I had on day one. I, I pretty much, certainly metaphorically, maybe even physically, bound down the corridor each morning. I love doing what I do. Because I'm still good at it, but I'm good at it because I work hard. You leave nothing to chance. You turn up on time. Well done, everybody was here before 9.30. Quite well done to everybody who arrived at 9.32. But it won't work in telly. Missed the first two minutes of the program. Blank screen. Not good. Not good. Uh, we did have a fire alarm on, um, Leah, on, on Soccer Saturday. We had a, we had a fire alarm uh, in the building. You might have been watching six weeks ago. And we all had to, we, we, we always try when this happens, we always try to say, no, presenters have got to stay, director's got to stay. Security having none of it, everybody out, no exceptions. So we were all outside, freezing cold. It was dry, thank goodness. Um, but Jeff Stelling and Paul Merson and the boys were all standing around waiting. We played. This is how little the ordinary person outside walls like these understand what goes on. We played the same report on Tony Pulis uh, arriving at West Brom, I think about seven times on a loop. Uh, before we could get back in, and so many tweets. I know, I know Sky loved Tony Pulis, but why are we seeing this report? So I had no idea. And then the, um, the you may have seen this on YouTube. You can, you can check it out on YouTube. It's quite fun. The, the firemen who eventually did pass the building safe were invited onto the set. Uh, so there is Jeff Stelling with, with men in yellow helmets. Um, we made a, you, you turn everything to your advantage. We've had a little bit of fun out of that. It is on it is on YouTube. And by the way, we, uh, Kath mentioned the Ryder, the Ryder Cup at Celtic Manor, which I covered. This is about as unglamorous as it gets. Celtic Manor, uh, Ryder Cup 2010. Yes, 2010. It rained for pretty much the whole of the first three days, which is why the tournament was moved on into the, the fourth day. Imagine the most soaked you can possibly be and treble it. That's how soaked we were by about 10 o'clock on the first morning. And there is a very good, very funny clip. Um, if you can, you can find it on, on YouTube of me looking very, very wet and, wet and bedraggled. It's glamorous it isn't. And in fact, the, the cameraman who worked on that on day two, when he walked back up the very steep hill to get to the first of three buses that would take us back to the hotel that was in the wrong city because we booked it too late, uh, so I think I might have trench foot, and he meant it. He hadn't actually a trench foot, but it was really very, very unpleasant. Glamorous, it isn't. I've no idea what time it is. I've probably waffled on far too long. I have, um, but Mark Modell's not here, which is good. Um, Who would like to ask a question? Come on. Actually, I'll, I'll, since I'll start you off. Um, who are the sports nuts? Who's, who's a real sports fan as opposed to quite interested? Okay, you know a lot about it? Yeah. All sports? Kind of <laughs> okay. Uh, who won the Open Golf last year? Okay. Okay, who won Wimbledon? Women's? Well done, okay. You, you, you had your money where your mouth is. Who else, who else is a sports nut? Oh, not so many now. <laughs> Funny that. Okay, you ask me a question. Who wants, who wants to know anything about careers in journalism? Yeah. Sorry? Most difficult, that's a good one. Um, going the reverse way about this, very often the people you are told are going to be really terrible have actually been delightful. Um, Alan Bennett, to pick somebody local, um, a playwright with uh, massive Leeds connections when he went to Leeds Grammar School. 
Uh, I was told he would be terrible. He was delightful. Um, who was the most difficult? Um, not many. I can't, I can't think of one that was really difficult. If you, if you know your stuff and if you are... If you're well prepared and you're confident and you treat people like ordinary people, as opposed to people you should be in awe of, um, you're almost always okay. Um, it's if, you're, if your prey uh, senses you are scared, it's like being in the jungle, then um, they might be tempted to be difficult with you. I never interviewed Brian Clough. I think he might have been tricky. Have you Who? Brian have I done Dan Clough? Yes, I have, yeah. Yeah, he was fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, he had just won the Open, to be fair. So um, uh, that was another very, very wet weekend. Very, very unglamorous weekend. But yeah, uh, Tiger would be difficult. I've never done Tiger. Tiger would be difficult. Um, Andy Murray can be a bit, can be a bit surly, but he's he's much, much better in real life than than you might think. Um, <laughs> most people are okay if you are if you treat them normally. Princess Anne. Um, I did at Buckingham Palace one time, and she was, she was great. Um, just treat them with respect, obviously, but, but uh, treat them normally, and they're mostly fine. It's a good question. Any more? It's a really good question. The Adam Johnson story yesterday. Um, <coughs> Anyone not know the Adam Johnson story? Do, do tell us, because our friend's going to tell you. you. Everyone knows. Good. Um, yes, you have to be really, really, really careful. And we, in that particular instance, we would rely on Martin Brunt, who is the Sky News crime correspondent of many, many years standing, worked for the Mirror before that, he's been at Sky more than 20 years, knows absolutely everything and everybody in the crime world. So the initial report was uh, a man, then a Premier League footballer. Uh, when Martin Brunt says, we can go ahead and and name him as Adam Johnson, um, then we do it. But you don't do it until you've got someone that your years of experience tells you you can absolutely trust because you clearly um, cannot get that story wrong. Uh, and then you just follow all your basic guidelines from, from McNay's Essential Journalism. And you, and you uh, all those guidelines are guidelines and they are there to be bent as far as you think you might be able to bend them. But all your years of experience and all your all your senior colleagues and your on-duty lawyers, we have a, a, a lawyer on call 24 hours a day, and we have a Sky News has a lawyer in the office um, in normal working hours, uh, and they are busy people. And you check, you don't take any risks. Uh, anything that might have a problem with it, uh, it, it applies not just to legal cases, but also to, to items where taste might be an issue. The, the beheadings uh, that Jihadi John carried out, for example, umpteen emails, internal emails in Sky News, making sure that everyone understood um, who needed to be referred to before we broadcast anything. Because um, there, are, there are important taste considerations as well as legal ones. Mr. Horsman. I was going to ask, what was the point of Sky News in 2015 when anyone looking around the room now, looking down at the little phone, do we actually still need a rolling news channel? Yeah, it's, really, it's a really good question. I've just given you part of the answer. Um, you can, everyone can access um, material that is not um, properly channeled, that is not coming to you necessarily from uh, experts you trust. Um, the reason that people turn to um, Sky News, and they do in, in enormously increased numbers when there's a big story, is they know we will do it well and with authority. Uh, when you've got people like, in this case, Martin Brunt, who's been... Um, who's known more about most crime stories than most coppers for, for 20 years, and the cops will tell you the same thing. Um, it's the authority, it's the expertise um, that you trust. Now, that will, it, the, the process will gradually change. The, 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 the role of the, the rolling news channel is, is changing a lot. Um, we devote, at Sky News, we devote a lot more of our time, a, a huge amount more of our time now to other forms of disseminating news than the rolling TV news channel, but there is no sign that the, the death of the rolling channel is imminent because it, we, we, we uh, channel it to you in a way that we think you want, and we do it with 
uh, on the one hand, um, expertise that I just referred to, and on the other hand, with some ability to make it entertaining and engaging, um, because it is, more, it is more entertaining and engaging uh, to watch Jeremy Thompson or Kay Buddy with all their years of experience and their ability to provide a bit of a light touch, and, and that hopefully I do as well in, in the sports field, than to just click on another button. But clicking on the button is quicker. So, so there'll, always, there'll be a role for both, I think, for as long as I can force it. Yeah, in the back. Um, drive placements seem quite difficult to get out of. They are, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, it's a really good question. Those who didn't, didn't hear, what can you do to make yourself stand out in the application process for, for Sky, for placements and so forth? Um, well, the first thing, I've already referred to it several times. Don't make mistakes when you, when you, when you apply, because it'll probably go straight in the bin. Might go straight in the bin. Princess Anne with no E literally might go straight in the bin. Because there are, as you rightly say, it's so competitive, so many people want to do it, um, and the people who do the initial sifting process in the HR department are busy people. Um, they've got so many excellent applications. You've got one with people who can't spell the name of the royal family. Might not go straight in the bin, but it's not a good, it's not a good sign. So don't make mistakes is, the, is, the, is one, of the, one of the first things. But your, your level of experience, it's, it's great being able to say, I watch Soccer Saturday, so I'd like to be on it. Okay. It's fine, but you're not gonna, we're not going to give you a job on Soccer Saturday on that basis. Um, you, you need to, to be able to not just say you're committed to what you want to do, but you need to be able to show it. Um, so I think I I've, I've might have a real example here. Um, but some of, the, some of the applications we get... No, it's, I've logged myself out, don't, not to worry. Um, some of the applications we get uh, I, in my three years as being the... Um, the sports editor off-air as well as on it, hiring and firing, including taking work, work placement students. Some of the experience, the, the amount of experience that people of your sort of age had managed to get themselves was, I was astonished. It's fantastic. Uh, people who'd, who'd, who'd had some sort of work experience at six different national newspapers, three national broadcasting organizations, another, another half dozen or so um, other publications of, of one kind or another. Um, it, that, so that's the, one of the key things, is, is to be able to demonstrate that when you say, I'm super keen on this, anyone can say that, is to be able to demonstrate it. And that, that really stands out. If you, you can say near the top of your application, uh, I've already had experience at X, Y, and Z, at Telegraph, Guardian, BBC, ATV. And so I've had people who've, lots of people who've, who've done that. That's the really impressive thing, I would say. Um, if you can write in... If you can write in uh, an engaging fashion, that, that helps as well. If you imagine, put yourself in the position of the people who are sifting through this stuff, 500 applications, if there's something, that, something that's pleasant to read without, without waffling, that, that helps as well. But uh, the, the most important, the two most important things are probably the two that sprung to the top of my mind there, is, is don't make errors. I had somebody who, somebody who gave me they got their mobile phone number wrong. Um, they got the placement because it wasn't spotted in the application process, um, but it, it came up when they were working for me. I needed to get hold of them, and the mobile wasn't working because they gave me the wrong number. That wasn't impressive. That doesn't show a good level of checking. So don't make mistakes and be able to demonstrate that you mean what you say. Can we just do one last question? Because I'm aware that Mark Oh, why doesn't he come in? He should come in. Um, be good to see him. Uh, any, who wants to have the last question? Oh, I've bled go them all dry. With my cheeky request. Yes, go ahead. Um, I've asked Nick to uh, do a prize presentation for us, um, which links to a project that we worked on last year. So I think yeah. Um, now, where did, we, where did we leave that piece of paper? Here it is. Amazingly, I've got it last year. Um, You'll recall you were involved in the uh, big project reporting on the Tour de France, which was a fantastic event, which was, by the way, quite a challenge for us at Sky as non-rights holders. I could spend the next hour talking to you about the complications of covering sport uh, when you don't hold the, the rights. But don't worry, Mark Mardell, I won't do that. Um, but it, it is a challenge. Um, but we were able to 
to get a signal out of Reef, uh, which is about as remote as you can get in the, in the Yorkshire Dales, and, and just report on the, on the, uh, the effect that the, um, the tour was having on a community like that. But we weren't able to show any actual bikes uh, on our live signal. We, we, we have rights to show some of the, um, the rights holders' footage, but that's, a, that's another, another long story. But by the way, it was... Sorry, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm taking up the time that I would have taken with the last question to tell you this little story. I, I went on the, the Reef <coughs> Village or Parish uh, website uh, that week, and it said uh, Tuesday, Flower and Produce, Wednesday, WI, Saturday, Tour de France. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> Uh, only in Yorkshire, and only because of the, uh, the Tour de France. So uh, a whole team of students working from uh, January until after the Tour itself, reporting on the build-up and capturing uh, the excitement of uh, Le Grand Départ with the, the royal presence. And the university was always going to offer one prize. If I stand here, does that help? Yeah, it does. Uh, one prize, no, it doesn't, not much, uh, who contributed the most to the project, but um, even such great minds of Catherine's failed to pick out just one winner uh, all the students who took part made a great contribution, but two sports journalism students stood out in terms of their, and I quote, commitment, enthusiasm, and standard of work. So there are, are they both here? Yeah. Fantastic. That hardly ever happens. Brilliant. Um, so first of all, first prize winner and congratulations to Josh Robinson. Congratulations. Well done. Cheers. Cheers. So congratulations to Josh, and he shares the laurels with Henry Valentine. Congratulations. Well done. Cheers. There you go.